Welcome to Savvy Business, Life Unscripted, with your host, Christina Rivera, where our guests share their wisdom and valuable business tips, empowering our audience to expand their personal potential. Hi, Mike Singleton. Welcome to Savvy Broadcasting, Life Unscripted. I'm so grateful to have you here today. How are you? Uh, thank you for having me, Christina. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Ah, you betcha. I'm really, really grateful to have you here. You're a senior analyst and founder of Invictus Research, and you're just the person to help our entrepreneurs and business owners and anyone listening in who maybe is not an entrepreneur, but is a little concerned about the current job market. There's a lot of fears going out there. It's been a really crazy couple of years uh, with the economy, and I know you'll be able to um, bring some... I don't know, some peace to people, at least to have some knowledge and which would give people power. Um, but uh, before we go there, just fill people in. What even brought you to creating Invictus and how did that all come about? So it's a it's a good question. It's a little bit wonky. Out of <laughs> college, I worked for an investment firm called Broadrun Investment Management. It mm -hmm. was a, a long only investment firm that spent most of its time analyzing individual securities, individual stocks trying to figure out what drove the underlying businesses, what were their competitive advantages, uh, what was the quality of their management team like, uh, and so on. So what was their growth went, runway, stuff like that. And it was a really good job, and I learned a ton. And the three senior partners at the firm there were some of the best business analysts that I've ever met. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a great uh, place to start on Wall Street out of school. I got a lot of responsibility. I got the chance to lead my own investments from a, a very young age. Now, that said, I don't have anything negative to say about Broadrun. It was fantastic. But I did notice after working in the business for a little while that um, these bottom-up factors that I just described don't really drive all of the price action for individual securities. So if you're looking at you know, the stock for Apple, it's not just about uh, you know how management is executing some business plan. It's also about how the overall economy is doing. And uh, over, call it short to intermediate time periods, the macro economy actually drives the majority of the price action for most stocks. And in some market regimes, it can actually drive all of the price action. Famously, uh, the saying goes, correlations go to one through recessions. Mm -hmm. And so um, I figured that if I was going to become a better investor, I should learn something about the economy and the business cycle and how these exogenous factors can drive the price action and securities. And so I spent a lot of time learning about the economy, trying to learn about back tests, uh, trying to make the connections between the various economic uh, linkages in the economy between growth and inflation and monetary policy. And that was a very fruitful endeavor. I think it really enhanced my stock picking skills at the firm and uh, made me better at my job. After a few good years at Broad Run, I figured that I could create more value if I started my own firm and allowed anyone who was interested to start buying my research. And so that's how Invictus was conceived. Mm -hmm. So now Invictus is a boutique a macroeconomic and market strategy strategy firm. And what we aim to do is bring hedge fund quality research to uh, people that are not part of a hedge fund, right? To bring hedge fund quality research to everyone. Uh, we try and explain everything that happens in the economy in um, you know ordinary accessible language without all of the confusing jargon for which finance is uh, largely known. And our gimmick, if you will, is that all of our research is also delivered over video with a lot of very um, hopefully helpful and intuitive graphics so that our clients know exactly what's going on and they can develop a really deep uh, intuition for for what's driving the economy and what's driving mm -hmm. markets. So uh, that's the long story short. Yeah. Well, I'm grateful to have you here because our business owners run the gamut from right out of the gate um, startups to entrepreneurial um, on enterprise level and uh, all run the gamut. We're all in the same um, economy though. And I, I know some business owners are concerned. Uh, what is your take um, as far as what's going on now? And, and we're heading into a new um, election season. I know that this is also making um, a lot of businesses weary, like what's going to happen? What's next? What should business owners be paying attention to and kind of have their pulse on with regards to the economy? Sure. That's another great question. So I'm going to give you a short overview of the business cycle and why it matters. Feel free to interrupt if I'm becoming too long-winded. Mm -hmm. So in short, I would say that we're in sort of a late cycle slowdown in terms of where we are in the economy right now. Um, 
how would we sequence what a late cycle slowdown looks like? Well, let's rewind the clock back to late 2021. Inflation was running hot, hotter than the Fed's target. The Fed realized that maybe it had taken a little too long to tighten. And so the Fed, meaning the Federal Reserve, began to communicate to markets that it was going to start raising rates in 2022. So when the Fed says that it's going to raise rates, markets react near instantaneously uh, because markets are discounting mechanisms. They don't necessarily wait for the Fed to actually raise the policy rate. But when the Fed rate either raises rates or says it's going to raise rates, uh, that affects not just the Fed funds rate, which is the so-called policy rate, but also the entire U.S. interest rate complex. So that means short rates on the Treasury curve, like the, the six-month, the two-year, and so on. Also long rates, like the 10-year and the 30-year. Also private market interest rates, like the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. And that's a really important one. Mm -hmm. So when the 30-year, and we've, you know, I, I probably don't need to tell your listeners, we've seen the 30-year fixed mortgage rate go from sub-3% to over 7%. Mm -hmm. That's been almost completely a result of Fed policy. When the Fed raises interest rates, including the 30-year fixed mortgage rate, that almost immediately re reduces demand for mortgages because mortgages become a less affordable way to finance buying a home. If you look at the mortgage application data, mortgage applications for the purpose of buying a new home are down almost 60% peak to trough. So that's a very pure measure of demand and you've seen it just fall off of a cliff. Uh, mm -hmm. Given that, it's not surprising that we've seen total home sales also fall quite precipitously. Total home sales, uh, sales of both new homes and existing homes are down almost 40% from their cycle peak to their current trough level approximately. Mm -hmm. um, and the housing market is famously a leading indicator for anyone who uh, follows macroeconomics, right? And part of the reason for that is most people when they buy a home are also buying a bunch of durable goods with it as they furnish their home. So think furniture, think new cars, think mm -hmm. home appliances like washing machines or refrigerators. And these are really the what are called durable goods in the business that drive the manufacturing cycle. They're big, mm -hmm. expensive, oftentimes financeable items that are made in factories. So uh, when housing goes down, demand for durable goods goes down soon thereafter. We've seen that happen, right? And in response, manufacturing companies will cut production because there's not as much demand for their goods. These companies can't cut production forever right? Because that's not how you uh, run a business. You can't make money that way. And so eventually they respond to reduce demand and solar production by laying off people, mm. right? And so, uh, you know, and obviously once these layoffs metastasize beyond a certain point, that's how you get a higher unemployment rate. And really when you see the unemployment rate begin to increase quickly, that's when the NBER, which is the, the dating organization that dates recessions, mm. really begin to sharpen their pencils and say, okay, this is when a recession started. So I think the question is, where are we in this process right now? Yeah. And I would say that we are in the late cycle of this process. I could go through each of the statistics if you'd like, but yeah, essentially we're at the beginning of manufacturing layoffs. Um, that's going to begin to loosen the broader labor market over the coming months, at least in our view, mm -hmm. uh, which will, which will um, I'm sure that all of your, your business uh, owner listeners are familiar with how tight the labor market is right now. Yeah. We'll begin to loosen up the labor market the problem is that the Federal Reserve is not very good at threading the needle in terms of managing the labor market. And so what frequently happens is that the, they overshoot. And mm -hmm. this is sort of a, it creates sort of a vicious feedback loop. So it's yeah. very difficult to say, we're going to take the unemployment rate from 3.6% to 4.2%. It never really happens that way. And that's how you end up getting recessions. And that's why everyone likes to make fun of the Fed for being terrible at their jobs. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, it's just how monetary policy in the US and around the world works. Uh, so maybe I'll leave it there. And, and if yeah. you have any questions, I can follow up. <laughs> well, what I'm thinking, uh, Mike, also is that uh, regardless of what the uh, Fed is doing, um, I, I want to focus on what our business owners can do from a um, strategy st standpoint in their business, because the economy is cyclical. There's good times, bad times, recessions, and there's even businesses that do quite extremely well during bad times looking for those possible opportunities. Um, for for those business owners out there who are, you know, saying we're in the late stage uh, slow down era here, what what can we do as business owners? Now, we have business owners running the rank from service base to products. Um, should they invest differently? Should they maybe slow down hiring? Um, what is your take uh, or advice to those business owners? So when I talk with small business owners, 
mm-hmm. or business owners more broadly, what I hear most frequently is, wow, this is a really tight labor market. If I'm not giving five, 6% wage increases, people are leaving. When I need to hire a new, uh, you know, a new manager, it's really, really hard to find the right person. And I think the temptation would be to do what everyone is doing, which is pay up and just do what you need to do to get the person. Mm. And my suggestion, and it sounds very negative, is maybe give it a few months, right? Because if our forecasts are correct, uh, the unemployment rate is going to gradually increase through the end of the year. Wage growth is going to decline. Uh, The supply and demand of labor is going to shift in a way that is more favorable toward employers and less favorable toward workers. Mm. And um, if this advice sounds uncharitable, then you can always give your workers a bigger wage through a recession, a bigger wage increase through a recession. I'm sure that would be, uh, or or if it's not a recession, just a, just a, a softer labor market. I, I think the wage increases mm-hmm. would be just as appreciated then as well. Yeah. But the point being, I think the, the last, the time when you don't want to make a big investment in human capital is when human capital is really expensive. Just mm-hmm. like the time that you don't want to make a big investment into stocks is when stocks are really expensive. Um, mm-hmm. Even though that's that's probably when your gut and your intuition is saying, you just got to do it. You just got to do it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's 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 the classic fear and greed dynamic that drives all business cycles. Yeah. Well, I- I'd love to hear a win win possibility for both the uh, the workforce and the employees, because I that that would be fabulous. Do you see there's a possible win for both sides? Um in the current uh, tra- trajectory we're on, or or it's just going to cyclically eventually get back to a better uh, position going forward because we don't know what's going to come up in the next you know year or so. So I'll say um, historically, over the shorter term, historically, what has saved the Fed from these policy mistakes that lead to recessions, it's it's usually productivity booms. Mm. Uh, they're somewhat unusual. I think that there is the premise for one right now through artificial intelligence. If if you believe that it can, uh, the the benefits of artificial intelligence can flow through the economy. Well, so how do quickly. you feel about that? How do you feel about AI? I've heard a lot about chat GBT, about it's going to revolutionize business. What's your take on that? Do you feel that it's really going to revolutionize business or it's too early to tell? I do. I do. I think it will be just as influential for white collar businesses as globalization was for blue collar businesses. Um, it's really interesting. I have, uh, I, you know, I use chat, chat GPT and artificial intelligence from the perspective of analysis, and it essentially replaces the need for, you know, a junior analyst, one junior analyst on my team, uh, rather than having to ask someone to go do a project. Hey, why did the, does the relationship between these two economic variables exist? Uh, I can ask chat GPT and usually it takes a little prodding because it's not always, it doesn't always give its best answer first, yeah. but that's a little bit like a human, right? Yeah. Um, but but that's to say, I mean, the, the I think the impact on white collar jobs is going to be significant and it's only going to get larger because we're working with one of the most primitive models of artificial intelligence right now. This is a very yeah. early iteration. Yeah. Back to your but- earlier question, I, I hate to sound like such a doom and gloomer. So I'll, I'll, I'll also say this. The U.S. economy is clearly still the best economy in the world. Um, it has the best demographics of any developed country. It has, um, you know, the most robust economy that still has the capacity to produce uh, great technological advances that lead to productivity, boosting technologies like artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. And um, I'll also say that when you look at, so China is frequently called our, our greatest competitor. They have, I'm not a big bull on China, to be perfectly honest. They have all sorts of demographic issues. Mm-hmm. I think one other um, one other difference between China and the United States and their growth algorithm is that uh no one really wants to immigrate to China. They also don't want immigrants. So yeah. the, the point being that immigration is not going to be a tailwind for economic growth for them. The U.S. has and has always had a, a line of people that want to immigrate to this country because, like I said, it has the best economy, the best technology, the best rule of law. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't maybe it doesn't seem like it right now, but general political stability, policymakers that are generally well educated and well informed, and make good decisions on behalf of their constituents. Mm -hmm. And, um, not, you know, not that immigration solves every single issue. You know, I don't think it does. It's obviously a more nuanced conversation. The point being that that's a reflection of something that's good happening in the United States that you're not necessarily seeing elsewhere. Well, that's interesting. You say that because I think, uh, 
when folks step out of the U.S. and and go to countries around the world, you begin to see how blessed we are here. And and many people haven't left our shores. So uh, until you leave and you start talking to people in different countries and experiencing wonderful cultures, but still they look to us and say, hey, I I want what the U.S. has. So we are completely very, very blessed. Now, you mentioned something else that I I think was very important, and that is um, with immigration and and the constant of new folks coming in, it leads to um, disruptive innovation. I I think that could be the change that brings us back to a better market is that when things get tough, you do have to get you have to have tenacity and figure out, okay, there's a tough situation here as a worker bee, as an employer, or how, how are we going to get our way out of it? And sometimes that creative thinking, that ingenuity could be just the thing that could explode our market. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And when you think, when you look at different economic variables mm-hmm. and how does what you just described translate into the data, uh, at first you think maybe it doesn't, but but it's through that productivity channel again. And productivity if there's a magic you know, seasoning that you can season on the economy that will help enhance economic growth and will help reduce inflation, it's productivity. And the faster your productivity growth, the better your long-term economic growth and the slower your long-term inflation. It's like the Goldilocks mm-hmm. ingredient, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, again, this is what the US has in spades. And there, believe me, there, there are plenty of things that policymakers could do to enhance long-term productivity growth. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you're looking at the United States relative to the rest of the world, the U.S. seems to have it in spades compared to everywhere else. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, um, I'd love to keep going on with you, but we ha- we're coming to a close here. But I did have an interesting question. I saw that you went to the University of Notre Dame, where you studied not only finance, but theology. And I thought, well, that's odd. Why did you Why did you study f- theology? And did that come into play with your day-to-day work uh, at uh, Invicta? So it's it's a funny question. I think the reason I studied theology is because I love it. I went to Catholic school all the way through my my schooling from elementary school mm-hmm. to university at, at Notre Dame. Uh, do I use it in my day-to-day job? I think the answer is yes. And if I thought longer about the question, I could probably give you more, you know, better answers. Mm-hmm. But I will say that um, when you study theology, at Notre Dame, what you end up doing is a lot of reading and you deal with a lot of difficult texts, old texts, oftentimes classical texts, Mm -hmm. and you have to have a long long attention span to get through them. And you also need to hone your critical thinking skills because a lot of times these ancient authors don't think about things the way that you think about them. But when you really engage with them, they're making really, really good points. Mm -hmm. And um, it forces you not to be superficial in terms of how you engage with uh, information. Right. And in the markets, it's the same thing. If you if you are looking through, you know, the BLS report on inflation or GDP or whatever, and you're only engaging with it on a superficial level, uh, if you're only a first order thinker, so to speak, that will generally get you killed in markets uh, or it'll cause you to lose money, to use a a less crude phrase. Um, And I think that learning how (laughs) learning how to engage with these theological texts from the last 2000 years actually ended up being super, super helpful. Um, on a higher level, I would recommend, uh, any kind of liberal arts that help you with your critical thinking. I think critical thinking is the most underrated skill set that anyone in finance and I'm guessing more broadly, uh, Mm -hmm. any job can have. Yeah. Well, that reminds my study of philosophy and Greek mythology and all of that. I mean, it's so much deeper. And also even studying when I've studied um, the Bible, there's parts of history that are so deep that you see how humankind hasn't changed all that much from the Roman Empire or the Greek Empire and how often um, different forms of organizations and governments uh, do the same thing over and over again. And we can learn from our ancestors and maybe hopefully not keep repeating the same mistakes. You're, you're right. And there's so many parallels between what you just said in markets, and mm-hmm. I, I could go into them all day. <laughs> well, I don't want us to leave without everyone finding out how they can find out more about you, more about Invictus Research. How can they do that? So we are at Invictus-Research.com. Like I said, our goal is to provide hedge fund quality research to everyone. We do it over video. Our flagship product is the Daily Edge. We cover all of the prior day's economic data. And uh, and like I said, make it really accessible, really simple, uh, pretty short. And it's a video, so it's not just another terrible you know, PDF PowerPoint slide in your inbox. And you can also find us on Twitter at Invictus Macro. 
Awesome. Do you have a YouTube channel as well? No. So okay. we have Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I have to thank you again, Michael Singleton, for coming to Savvy Broadcasting and sharing your great wisdom. Hopefully, this will keep everyone calm about the um, static economy because it is cyclical. We're going to find our way out with that ingenuity. And I know your company is going to be a big help in helping our companies do that. Thank you so much for coming to Savvy Broadcasting. Thanks for having me, Christina. You betcha. Looking for a hilarious read? Well, check out my latest book, My Crazy Roommates. The names have been changed to protect the deranged. Step into the wild and unpredictable world of young adulthood in the heart of New York City. Brace yourself for a roller coaster ride through the trials, tribulations, and hilarious moments of shared living spaces with a colorful cast of characters. Fasten your seatbelt and get ready to laugh, cringe, and maybe shed a tear as you delve into the pages of My Crazy Roommates. So get your copy today, available at Amazon.com.